Hello, it's Miniature Monday once again. I'm Callum, a painter here at War Games Illustrated, and with me is Project Manager James. Hello, I am Project Manager James. You are Project Manager James, it's the full thing. Oh, I've, yeah. I've brought some models to show you here today, haven't I? You did, and they are very nice. These are Thanks. the new Conquistadors from War Games Atlantic. Well, new-ish. They've been on the way for a while, but supply chain and all that has been... been a crazy few years, hasn't Yes, it, it has. Um, but these are some of the nicest plastics I've seen from they all games at They wonderful. A real joy to work with. They are indeed. And you've done an outstanding job on them. Oh, thank you. Uh, quite a mix of approaches here. Absolutely. So we had the 12 here, which were more batch painted, lower army level. I would say higher army level compared to most, but... <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> and then we've got three more detailed models that we wanted in our observation post to really show off the crisp, clean sculpts, honestly. Uh, yes. I really could achieve quite a high finish because they're really good. They are, and uh, they're an interesting box because for the first time in any of their historical sets, I believe, there's actually two different frames. Mm -hmm. Normally it's just the one, but you get, it's not really a command frame, is it? It's got the- it's like uh, upgrade almost. Yeah, the different two-handed weapons come on a, a separate frame with some extra head options. Yes, which almost slants to different periods if you wanted to, I yeah. think more, more of a suggestion of a different time. That's for sure. And I'm, you've taken an interesting approach. These are actually painted more as sword and buckler men. Yes. Uh, and this is for, never mind the Bill Hooks Deluxe, which is coming actually quite soon. So these are for the Spanish in Italy, yes, fighting they in Italy. Are. Yes. Whereas these are more your typical conquistadors, yeah. wreaking havoc and destroying indigenous peoples across the uh, <laughs> Americas. Lovely guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about your painting approach. First to this unit of 12. Sure. How do you start when you're doing something like this? So I kept the, saw, the shield and the head separate. So I had uh, the arms, which weren't really covering the bodies, and the, uh, the arms holding the shields. Uh, so they weren't really messing with any of the detail I had here. Uh, first off was a light spray of a very light color, because we've got lots of bright, kind of clean uh, sections. It also meant that I was using metallics. It was very easy to get like two thin coats and have coverage. Uh, for those bright shining areas. So that in itself, quite unusual. And this is something that I see you do a lot in your metallics. I would always start with black for metallics, but you quite often go over white to get that I wanted pristine them, shine, is that I really? wanted them to be really bright and clean and that kind of that aesthetic of conquistadors and, you know, gleaming armor, rampaging and... Yes. The, so I, I really, I really enjoyed that. And the, the models themselves really benefit, I think, from a clean not to say that you couldn't paint them in a grimy setting, but I think because they are so like well defined and yeah. you can see clear delineation on the arms where the where the, the armor meets, I, I really enjoyed getting to you know have that kind of shine to them. So in terms of your your color palette that you've chosen, what was your inspiration for the choices you made? So there? I, I did a little bit of research online and looked at Spanish city flags. And I found kind of a, a scheme that would be quick enough to represent. So I found one: red, green, white. Uh, I think there was another spot colour in there, but I really liked that it would be fairly quick, especially over a light spray, as we said earlier, uh, to get quite a quick, high level of contrast on it, but, you know, clean. Um, and I, th I think it helped me in terms of speed. I, I managed to get through them to a fair decent, fairly decent quality, I think. Callum is being modest. They're a very high quality. Nice. I don't want to brag. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what, what these really highlight is that if you do a clean application of colour and then just pick a few select spots to really focus the detail rather than trying to make everything look yes. highlighted and given that detail to a high level you can make a great looking unit you a lot have faster illusion. than you might otherwise do i think part of it is the detail is sculpted in such a way so on this one on the back we've got quite a, a quilted pattern yes you literally need to highlight the top two points of those diamonds and you get a, a nice illusion of that highlight as you say very cleverly cutting corners but still looking quite visually interesting and you've, you've braved things like the eyes on these figures, which is, so, a, is a detail that many of us would skip. The, the, I was stuck with the rule of faces and bases, so I wanted the faces to really kind of draw you in. I imagined like, all of them looking, peering over their shields. I thought it would be quite an interesting shot for the magazine. So, yeah, the faces I kind of went to town on, perhaps maybe a little too far. But, but um, it works, you know. I'm guilty of it all the time. It's... Uh, they're really... They're, they're actually very good face sculpts as well. The eyes uh, are, are quite well portioned on the face they've got 
you know, the recess and then a slight, you know, curve to it. So you've got some, a canvas to work with at least. That actually can be one of the areas where plastic figures are more forgiving than a lot of the metal figures. Absolutely. They're, they're both square set on, well, not square, do you know what I mean? They're square with each other. They're li in line. Um, so they were a real fun face to paint. Yeah. And uh, you've, as you mentioned, the metallics being quite shiny, but that was the one little change that you made at the end of the painting process. Yes, by request. A lot of the shields actually look like dustbins. Everyone wielding them, it looked like they were <laughs> cosplaying. Uh, it's because it was all bright silver, or a, a wall of it. I, having stepped back and looked at it, I agreed it was too monotonous. So I actually went back in, and I, I, I tried to look at period kind of shields around, around the era. Some of them were darker metals. There was a lot of gold and bronze filigree. They were quite ornamented, some of them. So I went in, picked some different patterns. They've got this almost like orange segment kind of pattern to them so it was quite nice i varied them up a lot so you can see on this spin here i, I picked different segments here i alternated them to have like a different pattern we had a nice soft gold on it i thought it wasn't too bright it didn't distract too much but it just added that pop of color and across the range of them i did some washers give a bit more of a, a tin kind of look to some of them there was a darker wash for older ones and then two of them i actually mixed in a little bit of black with my thrash metal gave them another coat and highlighted them. All the shields are just a quick little dry brush, a gentle soft dry brush, just to catch a little bit. It helped tone down the bronze and the gold as well, tied the, the metals together. But I think as a, as a unit, it really just gave them that little extra, extra spot that they, they probably needed to help visually tie them together, but also make it not just it's you know a bunch of clones stood together so yeah for sure and the other interesting thing i find with the metals is because they're very bright they're very reflective they actually illustrate the sort of area that these men would be fighting in and, and that very sun bleached kind of look i was conscious that it was spanish fighting in italy so it's reflected in the basing as well we've got light green grasses uh, quite verdant and i thought it would help tie them together. I really did enjoy that kind of bright, shining, gleaming in the sun, as it were. I thought, and I think t together, it helps tie them into their space that they, they occupy. For um, sure. And that's, I think that's even more apparent on the, should we say showpiece versions yeah, that you did of these figures? Yeah, I fair to say. Uh, I spent a lot more time individually on each of these. Uh, they're based, again, on Spanish city flags. So this one was blue. Uh, the one we've got showing, uh, spinning here, is blue, pink, and white. I did a little bit of freehand on the arm because there was a yellow sun, I believe, on the, the flag itself. So I wanted to tie that in. Obviously, it's visually interesting to look at. Uh, that also, that one used the upgrade sprue. So that has yes. uh, two handed swords on it. It's got like pole arms. Yeah. I and went for the kind of. The detail on this that you've added is really nice. You've painted on some wood grain here, right? I've been trying to identify areas where I could increase that quality without spending too much time. So wood grain on a, on a clean plastic sculpted you know, area. It's very easy, very quick, and it always, you know, it's one of those details that reward you as you look closer. What's your uh, approach for that? Is it just a, a sharp pointed brush? Yes, and... I normally use a slightly larger brush, a two or a three, because it can hold more uh, paint in the body of it, but as long as it's got a sharp point, if it's new or you've just washed it using some brush soap or something. And yeah, I normally thin it down to just above kind of maybe a wash consistency, so you can build up the texture in several quick passes. It doesn't have to be too fancy as long as you you know account for some wood grain some circle textures you know that kind of and, and don't make them straight lines you know it's wiggling no. like like a, a wood knot would be whereas on the actual blade of the weapon here you have done more of a sort of straight line texture on there yes i wanted some scratches again it was still clean but i applied a bit of thinned wash on the metallics just to give them a bit of depth and then i went in with a bright high highlight of, of you know a white metallic almost i think i mixed in some of the white alchemy scale sub 75 to the base mix. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's quite quite rare to see, especially on uh, historical figures like these, metals that don't have that black tone in the recess, and it gives it a very different feel. It's almost gr like a soft gray, isn't it? Yeah. I, I really liked it. It was just thinned down with some medium, um, and it always helps dull the metallic slightly, even even after you've done your, your varnish. I, I just liked how, how it, it came out. I was really, really happy with it. It almost feels like a hybrid between true metallics and exactly. non metallics. Exactly, it does. So they're actually primed grey, a very light grey. And so then I think that helps build through all the colours. Whatever you prime with, you always see slightly in your finished product. Uh, and Particularly so, if you use paints in translucencies like you do when you paint. Yes, it. absolutely. If you are glazing at all, any metallics that are kind of have good pigment but still retain the original shade. So if you start with a black, you'll end up with a nice dark metal. But with these, the grey, it did almost become. 
uh, hybrid, you're right. I th and I, I did quite like that because it was very easy and very quick to achieve. Yes, it looks really good. Um, so let's move on to this crossbowman here. He's very similar to the, the big unit that you did. He is. But with a little extra level of detail on top. So there's a bit more refinement in the green uh, diamonds that you see on his vest. Uh, I tried to blend. I wanted to mix yellow into the green. I wanted to tint it towards that direction. So I did with these less subtly, but with this one really, we went to yellow and then to bone color at the very points. Um, just, and I think, I don't know, the, the kind of pattern, the quilted pattern always, it's very forgiving with blends. And I think you can get a really interesting, as long as you just do the top two, it really differentiates each of the diamonds and it's interesting for your eye to catch and look at. Yeah, for sure. And uh, the other area that maybe isn't initially apparent, but upon when you're getting really close that you've done and added a lot of detail here and to the previous figure, these are quite hair suits, gentlemen. Yes. So I thought it was an interesting, I hadn't really seen much of this in miniature painting. I thought it'd be really interesting to try. I wanted to make these models really hairy. So I actually went for the back of the hands. I thought it'd be a good area rather than trying to mess with where the neck, you would, probably wouldn't see it hidden behind the beard, but with the hands themselves. So we did an article on this. Uh, and it'll be coming in. Yes, it's in the Observation Post article alongside the review of these figures. Brill, so you'll get to see how to do it yourself. But it was a very simple process. Uh, I think it actually adds a lot. Again, it's that simple kind of small details that are only viewed when you really look up close, but they add a lot to the overall finish of the model, I find. And then finally, we're on to this guy who I think maybe is my favorite of the uh, lot. You know, it's funny you said that. I was going to say exactly the same. I think it's my favorite color combination. And an interesting little tidbit is the arms on this one actually started as the same color as the arms of the crossbowman as well. Right, and what has it changed them up then? So I built the highlights, the highlights have tinted it. And I thought it was an interesting example of tinting to orange and then tinting to pink. Yes. And that's, red is very hard to paint and highlight it because it always becomes one or the other. So I mean, was, yeah, to me, this isn't red anymore. Exactly. Like, I, this figure doesn't read as a red figure. But this one actually wasn't at the start. Wait, it was a red and a blue mixed together to give us more of a purple. Right. In high, sorry, I'm going back. No, we, we show these side yeah. by side. And as you, as you look at the differences, the use of the white in there is really, it's, it's, it's almost powdery. Yes. But not in a bad way. No, it's, it's a very strange highlight. It, it's not the most refined, but I think, again, the placement of the highlights sell the effect enough and it was just finding those key points where the light would be hitting so we do the, the clear cut shoulders it helps define the model and the shape of it we did the forearms because again you're drawn to the hands the guns the faces yeah it's the areas around those that you really want to pull the eye so again we don't focus too much around the elbow we've got a little bit in the creases but you don't that's not a focus point it's around the hands it's the shoulders it's those those areas where you, the light would catch and where you'll see it on the model. Yeah, and I think the intro, you mentioned the elbow. A lot of people who were painting in more of a, a line edge highlight style, that would be the point that they would pick out. But it's, it's not where light would really catch fabric realistically. Yes. I've, I've moved away, that was you know, my typical style, is the heavy metal, you know, highlight everything. But I've, as I've been painting more historical stuff, I've found more joy in translating light onto cloth and metal and that kind of, almost accurate representation of life. I'm not going to go ahead and say it's spot on. It's a stylized version of it, but you're I, trying to... Yeah, I often say it's creating the illusion of realism. It's the illusion of realism, that's exactly it. You don't actually want to create realism because realism on a figure this small would instantly be unrealistic. Yes, absolutely, and it would you would not really notice much. Everything no. would be fighting for your attention. Well, they do all look outstanding, oh, but I'm going to let everyone in on a little secret, Callum. You know what I'm going to say, I don't right? know what you're going to say. The fronts of these outstanding showpiece models, they're a little bit more refined and detailed than the backs. Just a little bit. Whereas the unit that you've painted here, oddly, even though you did it quicker and less refined, the back is kind of the same standard as the yes. front. Why is that, Callum? So um, <laughs> it was in consideration of, of where the, the models will be appearing. So with these, they're not really gaming pieces, they are more display pieces. So the idea when painting them was that I was trying to within the constraints of four hours, what you can achieve with these uh, quite nicely sculpted models. So I was aware they were going to be shown from the front mostly, so I tried to yeah. pour as much effort into showing the sculpt depth uh, in, in that form. However, these models are more gaming pieces, so as a gamer you want to look at your models and, and enjoy them and not just see completely unpainted blank uh, backs. Uh, and I knew there'd be some fun shots of looking over the shields, anticipating a sure. charge. 
I like um, that you're assuming that you're going to be constantly seeing your models from the back. Because if I was gaming, I would be assuming I'd constantly be seeing my models routing <laughs> and running towards me. And in that case, your opponent gets to enjoy your beautiful painted bags. very good point. And you get to see the front of them. So. Excellent. Excellent <laughs> point. It's an excellent point. I hope it's not, because it'll be straight in their bags. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully you enjoyed checking out the fruits of Callum's labour here. I'm excited to see what's next and you should subscribe because there will be more of what Callum's working on with armies. You're actually doing some more stuff for Bill Hooks at the moment. I am, but that's between me and the Bill Hooks. There you go. But it won't be if you subscribe because we'll have more on the channel from Callum pretty soon. Uh, you could also comment and let us know what you think of these figures. If you've picked up any good techniques, it'd be great to hear from you and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, Wargames Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.